welcome in the name of Jesus to all who have come to worship him. For our service today will follow the order of worship printed in the bulletin, which is the service of the word. Let's begin our worship on this, the third Sunday in the season of Lent, by singing the opening hymn. That hymn is number 226, printed in the red hymnal. If you dwell 
dwelt, O Lord, upon our sinfulness, then who could stand? But with you there is mercy and forgiveness, and a guiding hand. Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, Amen. Lord Jesus, obedient in the desert, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, the promise of salvation, Christ, have mercy. Jesus, the flood of living water, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Having heard your confession, I assure you that our gracious Father in heaven has heard your prayer, and by the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen.
us pray. O oh God, the law no longer condemns, for Christ came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Grant that by faith we would live as your people with your law as our guide. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first scripture lesson for this, the third Sunday in the season of Lent, is the Old Testament lesson recorded in the book of Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We sing the psalmody which is printed in the bulletin. Yeah. 
The epistle lesson is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel according to St. John chapter 2 beginning at verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We sing the hymn of the day, hymn 752 in the Christian Worship Supplement book. You may be seated. Thank you. storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, where fears are still and striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. God in heaven. 
of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Hell on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain, land bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and now he stands in victory. Since curse has lost its grip on me. mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for today comes from the Old Testament lesson recorded in the book of Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 and 2. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. And we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there of course are many problems in our country. Everyone agrees with that. But I guess, how do you solve those problems? That's where the disagreement comes in. Some would say, to solve the problems in our country, you need to teach the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments serve as a summary of the moral law, the timeless law of God. <clears throat> But what has happened with the Ten Commandments in our country? Once they were prominently posted and now in public squares they have been taken down. <coughs> Why? Because there is, as many claim, a conflict between church and state. So the Ten Commandments are Nowhere to be seen, at least in the public square, although the statue of Moses still stands in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. 
So what do you think? Would teaching the Ten Commandments, emphasizing the Ten Commandments, solve the problems in our society today? God gave the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone, and that was the second time God gave the law. The first time that God gave it and gives it is when he writes it on the human heart. The law written on the heart is called your conscience. The problem with the conscience, of course, is that it can be clouded by sin or quieted by repetitive sinning. And so that there would be no mistake, God wrote down his law on two tablets of stone. Do you think it would go over well today to stress and emphasize the Ten Commandments? I don't think there's an appetite for that in our society today at all. Why? People just don't want to be bound by universal dictates. People want to make up their own laws with one caveat. That they want to do whatever they want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. Frankly, let's be honest, one of the hardest things to do on earth is to listen to God. But with that being said, the law does have the purpose of a curb. Remember from confirmation class, the three uses of the law, the curb, mirror, and guide. And when it comes to the curb, just think about the curb on the parking lot when you drove in this morning. What function did the curb serve? Well, you could drive wherever you wanted in the parking lot, but the curb hemmed you in, kept your car or truck from going outside of the parking lot. You parked on the asphalt today and not on the grass because of the curb. So the Ten Commandments have that purpose of curbing the coarse outbreak of sin in society. And so some would say, well, it makes sense then. If you take away the curb, society is going to go out of control. And if you re-emphasize the curb, society will be more moral. I think you and I have to be very, very careful when it comes to reaching for the law as a solution to society's woes. We need to be careful about finding in the law our answer. So today, see from the words that God spoke directly to the people of Israel who were standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, see in that law, at the same time, good, yet no good. The law is good and yet no good. Let's take up that no good part first of all. The law is no good for establishing a relationship with God. Children of Israel had been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. God had brought them out with a mighty hand and now they were camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses told the people, prepare to meet the Lord. They gathered at the foot of God's holy mountain and God, as our text says, spoke these words to them and they were terrified. But what did God say? I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. In those words, God expresses the truth that a relationship already existed with these people. I am the Lord. That's that special name for God in the Old Testament that refers to God as the, the saving God, the gracious God, the compassionate God. I'm the Lord, your God. See, a relationship already existed. God was saying, I'm your God and you are my people. I am the Lord. You remember that when God spoke to Moses from the burning bush on this very same mountain, and Moses asked him, if the people ask, who has sent you to us? What should I say? And God said to Moses, tell them I am who I am 
has sent me to you. This is the God that really exists. He's the God who says, I am the Lord your God. And you'll recall that Jesus, during his life and ministry, used that phrase again and again and again. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. With those words, Jesus was identifying himself as the God who spoke to Moses from that burning bush. In his opening words, God declares that he already has a relationship with these people. He doesn't say to them, if you want a relationship with me, here's the ten rules you have to follow. No, he says, it already exists. I am the Lord your God. That relationship that God had with these people was a relationship of full and free grace. The relationship goes back to their forefather, Abraham. God called Abraham and said, go to the land I will show you. I'm going to give you that land. I'm going to make a great nation from you. But the biggest blessing is that from you, from your offspring, all people will be blessed. And of course, God was talking about the blessing of life and salvation that Jesus would win as a descendant of Abraham for all people. And when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he was just following through on that promise that he made to Abraham. He was showing kindness and grace and mercy to those poor slaves locked in slavery in Egypt. Forty years later, Moses said this to the people of Israel in Deut Deuteronomy 7. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You see, God did this for them because he loved them, not because of something found in them. My goodness, all they did was bellyache. We're hungry. We're thirsty. We want to go back to Egypt. We want to be slaves again. Oh, the, the reason that there was a relationship here was because of what God had established. The reason was found in God and not in the children of Israel. He had a relationship with them because of God's choice, because of his faithfulness, and because of his love and mercy good, and yet at the same time, no good. The law is no good for establishing a relationship with God. That's the way it is with some tools. If you have a chainsaw, it's good. It's good for cutting down a tree. But it is no good for cutting a diamond or for doing surgery. Nor is a scalpel any good for cutting down a tree. It's good for surgery, though. Good and no good. Even though that is true, it doesn't stop people from trying to use the law to establish a relationship with God. And the people famous for this in the Bible, of course, are the Pharisees. They wanted to look at the Ten Commandments and say, okay, we're going to obey these as best we can, and by doing this, we will establish a relationship with God. God will look at us and say, wow, I like you guys. I want to have a relationship with you because of how you have obeyed my commandments. And yet what is true from Scripture, we're told in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are saved by grace through faith and not by works so that nobody can boast. So that you can't boast and say, oh, look at what I've done, and therefore because of what I have done, God, you should have a relationship with me. The law is no good 
for establishing a relationship with God because you and I can't keep it the way God demands. And this brings us to one of those three purposes of the law. Earlier I mentioned the curb. The main purpose of the law is to serve as a mirror to show us our sin and our need for a savior. You recall that Jesus used the law in this way in his Sermon on the Mount. He said, you know, about that fifth commandment, if you think you've obeyed the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. I got some bad news for you. If you've ever had hatred in your heart towards someone, that is murder in the heart. And for those of you out there, you husbands, who think you've been great and faithful to your wife, here's the bad news for you. Whoever looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what is God looking at? He's not just looking at the outward actions. He's also looking at the thoughts and the desires and the attitudes of the heart. The main purpose of the law is not for establishing a relationship with God. The main purpose is to show us our sin and need for a Savior. And this is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 3. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Good, yet no good. No good for establishing a relationship with God. Good for expressing a relationship with God. God in grace and mercy has established a relationship with you. It's a relationship of mercy and love. And now you have an opportunity as his children to express your relationship to God directly. In the Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments, the first three talk about your relationship with God. And God says to you, here's how you express the fact that you have a relationship with me. You don't worship any other gods. You don't practice idolatry, be that open idolatry where you bow down to a statue, or secret idolatry where you trust in something in your heart like money. Instead, you worship the Lord your God and you serve him only. That's how you express your relationship with God. And when it comes to God's name, you don't misuse it by cursing or swearing needlessly or lying by God's name. Instead, you use God's name to pray and praise and give thanks. And God says, here's how you express your relationship with me. Remember my Sabbath day. Spend time getting rest for your soul through the hearing and learning of God's word and whatever you do, don't despise preaching and God's word. You recall how Jesus summarized the first table of the law, the first three commandments. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. <laughs> this purpose of the law is using the law as a guide. You and I hear from God that we are his people that he's a God of grace and mercy who sent Jesus to be our Savior. And we want to express our relationship with God. And God says, here's how you do it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's another way of expressing your relationship with God. You can do that through your neighbor. You know, how you treat your neighbor is really an expression of your relationship with God. And so in Commandments 4 through 10, God directs you to your dealings with your neighbor. And you'll recall how Jesus summarized these commandments. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. So in Commandments 4 through 10, you express your relationship with God through your neighbor by honoring and respecting and obeying your parents and others in authority, those whom God has placed into your life as his representatives. 
You do that by respecting and honoring the gift of human life and helping and befriending people in their bodily need. You do that by honoring God's gift of marriage. Whether you're married, single, widow, divorced, you honor marriage. You respect the fact that God has given to you possessions and he's given to other people possessions as well. And you help them to improve and protect their property and business. And you remember that one of the most precious things a person has is their reputation in the community. And so you seek to defend a person's good reputation. And finally, you're content with what God has given to you instead of always wanting what you cannot or should not have. This is how you love your neighbor as yourself. And all of these are ways in which you express your relationship with God through your neighbor. But what needs to be said about our expression of our relationship with God? It's often weak, isn't it? And yet, what is true, God's relationship with you remains strong and firm and steady. Because it's not based on what you do, it's based on Him and His faithfulness. He says, I'm the Lord your God. I establish my covenant with you, I don't go back on it. I don't go back on my word. In effect, God says to you today, I brought you out of the land of slavery. Not Egypt, but the land of slavery to sin and death and Satan. I brought you out of that land, not by the blood of a lamb painted on the doorpost down in Egypt, but by the blood of the lamb known as Jesus Christ, who poured out his blood as a payment for sin on the cross of Calvary. And of course, you heard Jesus in our gospel lesson today talk to his enemies, destroy this temple. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him. But then he also spoke about the assurance that you and I have that our sins are paid for. Jesus said, in three days, I will rise. I will rebuild this temple that you have destroyed. Imagine this, the Father is thrilled to hear you as his children address him, our Father. You are as much God's chosen people as the children of Israel were in the Old Testament. Jesus is not ashamed to be called your brother. You have a relationship with God, a relationship of full and free grace. And to express it, God doesn't say, climb the highest mountain. Nor does he say, swim the deepest ocean. Instead, he says, love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in response, you and I say, anything, Lord, anything. We will be happy to do anything that you direct us to do so that we can tell everyone and express this truth, we are your people, Lord. Good and no good. The law is no good for establishing a relationship with God, but it is good for expressing your relationship with God as long as there's proper motivation. Because God is not just concerned about the what, he's also concerned about the why. God doesn't want a bunch of grumblers. God isn't interested in having a bunch of slaves. And of course, the law is a handy tool to get a quick result because the law has threats of punishment that come along with it, right? And that is why the law is the only tool that can be used in a heathen society like ours. It's the only thing that the unregenerate person understands. Do it or else, irregardless of motivation, irregardless of how you feel. The law can curb the coarse outbreak of sin, but in the law you'll never find any motivation, only threats, only language that a degenerate society would understand. 
But you and I hear another voice, right? You and I hear that voice of God speaking to us from the mountain. And his word is still true today as it was the first time he spoke it. I am the Lord your God. I have established a relationship with you, a relationship of full and free grace because of what Jesus has done for you. And that message is the message that makes you and me glad and willing to do whatever the Lord asks of us. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We worship God with our offerings. You may be seated.
Please rise for prayer. In our prayers today, we remember Sandra Lee, the mother of Patrick Dexter, who's been hospitalized now for over a month. And we also uh, include a prayer for uh, the family of Brent Anderson. Brent's cousin, Chris Anderson, was discovered in South Milwaukee this past Tuesday, uh, passed away with mysterious circumstances. So we pray for the Anderson family. Father, we delight to address you as our Father because you have established a relationship with us, a relationship of full and free grace. Each and every day you give us an opportunity to express the truth that we are your children by faith as we live according to your law. Keep us from foolishly thinking that our relationship with you has to do with our obedience instead of your grace and mercy and choice. When necessary, use the law as a mirror to remind us of our sin and need for a Savior. And then use the law to direct our path so that we may walk as your children. Our society is afflicted by many problems, all due to sin. What you give in the Ten Commandments is universal for all people of all time. Grant that your law would curb the coarse outbreak of sin in our society. The law as a curb has no power to save and no power to motivate, yet it does have the power, with threats of punishment, to rein in the coarse and blatant outbreak of sin. Grant that this purpose may be more fully put into effect in our country and our society. Mercifully watch over those who are hospitalized, recovering from surgery, facing chronic pain, or long-term health problems, and all who suffer as, as a result of living in a fallen world. Do not forget about your child, Sandra Lee, who's been hospitalized for over a month. Lord, grant mercy and perseverance as well as healing according to your good and gracious will. Lord God, we remember today all those who have wandered from the faith. Grant that the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father who always stands in faithful love, willing to receive his children home. Merciful Father, how mysterious are your judgments and your ways beyond our understanding. We are grieved by the untimely death of Chris Anderson, Brent's cousin, and troubled by its circumstances, yet we seek refuge in your love, for you have assured us that it is more than sufficient for our weaknesses. In these dark hours, help us make diligent use of your word and sacraments so that by faith we may be able to resist the evil foe who seeks to destroy our souls and minds and bodies. Take into your care those whose hearts and lives are deeply affected by Chris's death and lead them to look to you for confidence and strength to face the future. Sustain them with your merciful hand and grant them your peace. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Let your good will be done here and everywhere. Father who art in heaven, let your kingdom come. Every day give us bread. Thank you for the sun. Forgive us our sins as we too forgive. Lead us from all the tempts, all the days we live. Keep us from every ill, from the evil one. Grant us grace bought for us by your only Son. You alone have the power and the glory, Lord. You alone reign as King, evermore adored. Hear us call on your name here on earth below. Now we sing your amen, yes, it shall be so. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 579, printed in the red hymnal.
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the visitors who've joined us today for worship. There are a few announcements. In about 15 minutes, we'll start with Sunday school in the fellowship hall, an adult Bible class in the cafe where we'll be finishing today the book of 2 John. Confirmation class will be held tonight at 6 o'clock p.m. It's not in the bulletin, but on Tuesday of this week at noon, a lady named Cindy Holman is going to visit our church, and she's the director of the early childhood part of our synod, and she's going to uh, talk to us uh, and give us aid and help when it comes to expanding our preschool. Uh, a week ago, we did find out that in order to expand our preschool, it's going to have to be licensed by the DCFS. And so that's going to uh, be a process that we're going to be uh, undertaking uh, as part of expanding our preschool. Please remember that we are having Lenten services on Wednesday. There's a supper served at 6.15 and then the service is at 7.00. And that's designed uh, so that if there are meetings uh, afterwards, people can come to the meal, attend the service, and then attend the meeting. And I see that this Wednesday we have church council at 8 o'clock p.m. Pastor Karlovsky is going to be here uh, from Lord and Savior, so let's make it worth his while. On Friday, men's Bible class will meet at 11.30 uh, in the morning. As far as uh, other announcements, you see in, in the bulletin there are a few pictures from the Lake Zurich Expo yesterday. There's a postcard from the Expo that was handed out, uh, included in your bulletin today. And if you want, you can visit the, uh, the telephone booth, which is called the TARDIS. It's, it's landed in the lower lobby of our church. Um, Thank you to the Tone Chime Choir for playing for our service today. And then also a reminder about our Holy Week services. Uh, March 25th is Palm Sunday. March 29th, Monday, Thursday, communion service. Our Good Friday Tenebrae service, March 30th at 7 p.m. And then Easter Sunday, Easter breakfast, 8.15, service at the normal time. And then Easter for Kids Egg Hunt at 10.45. And that's on April 1st. So yes, Easter is rather early this year. Otherwise, there is something to eat and drink uh, after the service today. That's served downstairs in the lower level. You're all invited to stay for that. Those are the announcements.